All right, hello everyone. Uh, about to start this uh, Lab 3 overview. Lab 3, uh, the title is Understanding pH and Buffers. The objective of Lab 3 is to define and correctly use the following terms such as disassociation, acid base, pH, buffer, buffering range, buffering capacity. Explain how solutions with different pHs compare with respect to their proton and hydroxide ion concentrations. Uh, calibrate, use a pH meter to measure the pH of a solution. That will actually be demonstrated in a video that's posted along with parts of the other parts of this. Uh, plot and interpret a pH titration curve to determine the buffer range and the buffering capacity of a buffer solution. That I'll go over uh, on this uh, overview. So when we're talking about pH and buffers, we're talking about solutions. Again, I've talked before about pH it has to do with measuring the concentration of protons, also known as hydrogen ions and in some instances they call them hydronium ions, in solution. Now, in the case of, uh, if you look at the top here, it says dissociation of water. Molecules held together by ionic bonds may be pulled apart in uh, two oppositely charged ions. It's known that uh, compounds where uh, chemical, the chemical bond or one of the chemical bonds forming the compound is an ionic bond. It's known that water can break ionic bonds pretty easily. Uh, it's covalent bonds that uh, are difficult for water molecules to break, if at all. Okay, usually I just say they can't break them because it takes special circumstances. However, um, the term disassociation, okay, when a compound that is at least formed in part by an ionic bond and that ionic bond is broken by water molecules, we call this disassociation. Now, anatomy and physiology classes refer to it as ionization because whenever you have a compound formed by an ionic bond, when water molecules break that ionic bond, that results in the release of a cation and an anion into the solution. Thus, they call it ionization instead of disassociation. Now, water molecules, when you have just pure water, scientists discovered that every once in a while, this isn't frequent, but every once in a while, okay, one of the two water molecules will pull off the proton of another. Okay, but we don't need to know that type of detail for this class. We leave that for chemistry chemist. So the way we describe it as biologists is that every once in a while a molecule of H2O okay will disassociate into a proton and hydroxide ion. However we write it with an arrow that points in both directions to indicate this is a reversible process. Okay so therefore when you have pure water okay when that water molecule disassociates resulting in the release of a proton and a hydroxide ion, we actually don't get an increase or decrease in these protons because we get an equal number of these hydroxide ions being released, thus it just goes back and forth. We never get a true increase or decrease in proton concentration. Therefore, the pH of pure water is described as being a pH of 7. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but when we say pH of 7, what happened, what, what, what occurred was scientists when they were measuring the pH of solutions, there's actually, okay, a specific concentration of protons in molarity. But scientists realized, you know what, we don't need to be that technical when we present information on the pH of a solution or changes in the pH of a solution, especially in our body. So what they did is they came up with a way of simplifying the actual pH concentration. You know this better as a pH scale, 0 to 14. So eventually we'll work towards that. But the way it works is in pure water, we have an equal number of protons and hydroxide ions in the solution. And basically the way they describe it is a proton concentration in pure water is roughly 1 times 10 to the negative 7 molarity. But so is a hydroxide ion concentration. Thus you can see this equals this equals this. All right. Now, down here I tell you the alternative names, but we, uh, what you call it, but uh, I refer to it as protons. We went over this in a lecture for uh, chapter three. One times 10 to the negative seven. This is why I put this uh, metric system table here. So it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. One times 10 to the negative seventh molarity, or molar sometimes as they'll say. 10 to the negative seventh, if you come down here on the scale, what we're actually saying is the concentration of protons is 0 .00000001. 000 000 000 000 000 000 in other words, it's less than a micromolar. So it's not a high amount and high high number of protons or hydrogen ions in the solution is basically what they're saying. Okay, but we don't see, we don't say okay pure water has a proton concentration of one times ten to the negative seventh. Okay, we actually convert that now. Before I get there, I'm talking about how they convert it to uh, what you to uh, representing it on the pH scale. 
uh, briefly to talk about acids and bases. Okay. You can read this here, but simply put, as I talked about in a class, okay, acids are often described as proton donors. Okay, but that proton came from a hydrogen ion, thus we write it as H plus as a symbol. A base is a proton acceptor. Okay, there has to be something in the base, okay, that basically can form a chemical bond with this proton, thus removing this charged if, uh, ion that's present in the solution, and they're showing you here ammonia and ammonium. Now, acids, as we talked about, okay, they're proton donors, just like in a lecture in lab, okay, today, uh, for lab three, the acid you would be working with is hydrochloric acid, which is described as a strong acid. And then for bases, which I said are proton acceptors, the base you would be working with in today's lab, lab three, is sodium hydroxide, which is considered a strong base. Acids are often defined as inorganic compounds that release protons into a solution. In other words, they're proton donors, causing the pH of the solution to decrease. Hydrochloric acid is the best example. Up here, for each drop of hydrochloric acid that you put into a solution, there's actually many molecules of HCl in each drop okay, of this acid entering this water-based solution. And every time that this HCl enters this water-based solution, it's an ionic bond that forms this acid. Thus, it undergoes ionization, resulting in the release of this proton into the solution. Therefore, that's going to cause the concentration of protons to decrease, exceeding the concentration of hydroxide ions, and there's an inverse relationship. As the concentration of protons increase, the pH decreases. Once that pH falls below 7, that solution you're adding HCl to now becomes what we call an acidic solution. Whereas for the base, we're going in the opposite direction. Bases are described, however, as inorganic compounds, just like acids, but they remove protons from a solution. In other words, they're proton acceptors. Therefore, they cause the pH of the solution to increase. Sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide, the sodium ion, is, on, is uh, attached or chemically bonded to this hydroxide group through an ionic bond. Therefore, when you add NaOH to a water-based solution, it undergoes ionization resulting in the release of this cation. However, it's this anion, a hydroxide ion, okay? So in the case of anions in particular, it's not always a charged atom. Sometimes it's what you might call a negatively charged molecule. So this is a hydroxide ion or anion. And when this is released into solution, these hydroxide anions have an affinity or a strong liking for protons in the solution. Even though the sodium ions that they were a part of initially are there, they ignore that. They want to they want to chemically react with the protons in the solution, and they do simply creating water molecules. Therefore, what the base does, okay, is it increases the number of hydroxide ions into the solution. Again, each drop of sodium hydroxide has many molecules of NaOH. Therefore, it increases the amount of hydroxide ions in the solution. These hydroxide ions start to react, forming water, removing protons from the solution or neutralizing them, thus decreasing that causes an increase in our pH. When that pH of the solution that you're adding in AOH2 goes above seven, now we officially have what we call a basic solution. And for acids and bases, I don't go over this in much detail. This is just some information they give you in the lab. If you go into chem, you will need it, okay? But not all acids and not all bases are considered the same, such as hydrochloric acid. It's described as a very strong acid, whereas there are weak acids, such as acetic acid. Likewise with bases, some bases are described as being very strong bases, such as NaOH. Other bases are considered weak bases, such as ammonia. Okay, now this weak acid and weak base, the reason why I mention it here is going to eventually going to have to do with solutions called buffers. Now, uh, pretty much everybody, I've, every student I've had come through my class, 99% of them, are familiar with the pH scale. There's a pH scale that has to do with measuring the concentration of protons in a solution. The scale goes from 0 to 14. All right. Now, I said before, in pure water, the actual concentration of protons is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molarity. But if you look over here at the pH scale, they're not saying 1 times 10 to the negative 7th. What they're saying here is pure water, just like over here. Okay, Pure water, just like over here. They're saying it has a pH of 7. They're not saying 1 times 10 to the negative 7. Well, what it is, is scientists came along and said, look, 
there's the actual concentration of protons in a solution, such as pure water, 1 times 10 to the negative 7th, molarity or molar. But they said, let's simplify this. Okay, let's try to simplify this and convert it to simply whole numbers. And, of course, a lot of work goes into this before they ever came up with the final uh, pH scale that's used today, 0 to 14. But what they've discovered is that if they take the negative log okay, of the proton concentration, such as down here, in pure water, okay, the proton concentration is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th. All right. But if you take the negative log of this proton concentration, what you end up with is a solution that has a pH of 7. So if you plug this into your calculator, you plug in 1 times 10 to the negative 7 and take the negative log of that, you should get 7. Okay. So basically, these values here, okay, are derived from the actual concentration of protons in a solution. Okay, but this is uh, easier to understand. Uh, how do you say, more pleasant on the eyes and the mind. So instead of saying pure water has a proton concentration of 1 times 10 to the sec negative 7th molarity, they take the negative log of this value and it equals 7. Thus, on the pH scale, they just say pure water has a pH of 7, which we know as a neutral pH. Now, the way it works, and I'm going to jump down here, is that the difference between pH values, in other words, the difference between a pH 0 to 1, a pH of 1 to 2, pH of 2 to 3, is 10 raised to an exponent. In other words, there's a tenfold difference. So therefore, what they're talking about is the difference in proton concentration from 7 to 8 is 10 times. Okay? There are 10 times as many protons in a solution with pH of 7 than a solution with pH of 8. Likewise, there's a tenfold difference in proton concentration between a solution that has a pH of 7 and one that has a pH of 6. A solution that has a pH of 6 has 10 times more protons in that solution than a solution that has a pH of 7. Tenfold difference is what they're talking about here. Okay, tenfold difference. Now, they're showing you a couple of examples, and you're going to have this in your pre-lab. It should be basically pretty easy, and you just use your calculator. You don't have to show me your work. Just punch it into your calculator. But it talks about if you have a solution that has a pH of 3, what you're actually saying is a proton concentration is 1 times 10 to the negative third molar. But like I said, you can go back to that table I gave you, the metric system table. 1 times 10 to the negative third molar is the same thing as saying 0 0.001 molar protons is per volume, uh, per uh, solution volume, okay, of protons. Solution B has a pH of 5. Notice this means that it has 1 times 10 to the negative 5 molarities, or molar uh, proton concentration, or if we rewrite it with the decimal value, you can see the difference here, okay? We have two pH values difference between pH, a solution with a pH of 3 and a solution with a pH of 5. So basically what they're showing you here to here is that their proton concentration of a solution that has a pH of 3, in this case, is 20 times greater than the solution that has a pH of 5. We go from 5 to 4, which is missing, to 3, so that's 10 and 10. 20-fold increase in proton concentration is what they're saying. But again, okay, this isn't as pleasant on the eyes. This is much easier to work with here. So thus, they take the negative log of the actual concentration of protons and convert it to a simple whole number that falls between 0 and 14. Now, in today's lab for lab 3, if had we met in person, what you would have ended up doing is creating three solutions or putting together three solutions. Okay, One would have been an unbuffered solution, and two others would have been buffered solutions. Okay. Buffers, the job of a buffer solution is to maintain a certain pH. And buffers are not acids or bases. They're actually a mix of both weak acid and weak base. They have a little bit of both weak acid and weak base in them. Okay. The purpose of having these two, and I'm going to jump ahead, is so that, or actually, let me not jump it, is so that whenever a base is added to the buffer solution, that part of the buffer solution that is a weak acid will neutralize any hydroxide ions released from that base 
set such as if you were adding an AOH. Likewise, to that same buffered solution, if you were to add an asset such as HCL, the base part, the weak base part of that buffer solution would neutralize or remove the protons, thus keeping the pH from changing. So most buffers consist of a combination of a weak acid and a weak base. Therefore, we don't say they're, they're an acid or a base. Okay, they're just a separate solution. But do they have an effect on pH? Yeah, their job is to maintain a set pH. So the purpose of this beaker here is just to show if we had a buffer solution of pH 7, okay, then this would have a certain mixture, okay, or ratio of weak acid and weak base that would help it be able to maintain a pH of 7, even if you were to add an acid or base, such as if you were to add an acid such as HCl, it would undergo ionization, releasing protons. But that part of the buffer that is a weak base, denoted by A negative, okay, that weak base would react with the protons, removing or neutralizing those protons, therefore preventing these hydrogen ions or protons from increasing in solution, preventing the acid from increasing the concentration of protons in the solution. Therefore, the pH would stay at 7. Okay. Now, physiologically speaking, I have a slide that will point out, okay, physiological relevance to pH, and it, and it overlaps heavily or mostly with uh, what we covered uh, in lecture. Okay. So just to give it physiological relevance rather than, uh, hey, you did a pH lab and that's it. So if you look here, what I've shown you here is from companies. Okay, our lab techs, depending on the lab experiment we do, they will order pre-made buffer solutions. Okay, such as our non-majors, our 1408 non-majors, uh, which is a non-major uh, version of this 1406 course, they work with the buffer solution pH 7. So you can order these. However, our bodies have three chemical buffer systems, which I'll show you on the PowerPoint slide. Okay. Now, what you're going to do, as I said, in the lab is, or what you would do, but it's going to be on video this time, is you would prepare three solutions. We would give you the stock solution. You would have been given the stock solutions, and you would have to calculate, okay, uh, or first of all, you would have to know which stock solutions you need to use, and then you would have to calculate how much of those stock solutions you need, okay, in order to create an unbuffered solution as well as two different types of buffered solutions. And then what you would do is perform a process called a titration. Okay, whereby you determine how much acid and how much base, in particular, the two different buffer solutions can neutralize, maintaining a certain pH. Okay, but, but you would keep adding the acid or base, okay, until the buffer runs out of that weak acid or base. In other words, you would keep adding acid or base to the buffer until it reaches a point of saturation. So such as this experiment here, when my non-majors do this experiment, what they do is they count the number of drops of HCl they add to this buffer solution that maintains a pH of 7. Okay, And they'll also add HCl to just plain water. When they add HCl to plain water, one or two drops and the pH becomes acidic. The water becomes an acid now, not pure water. However, when they add HCl to the buffer, okay, instead of the pH of the buffer dropping uh, below 7 and becoming acidic after one or two drops, they literally have to draw, add anywhere from 30 to 50 plus drops of HCl before eventually the buffer runs out of the weak base it has, therefore meaning the buffer has reached a point of saturation. It no longer can neutralize any more protons because it's ran out of weak base and eventually HCl causes a proton concentration to uh, what you would call an increase, therefore the pH to decrease. And this is what you would have been doing for your titration curve in person. You would have kept adding acid, okay, and then separately performing the second part of the experiment, kept adding base to those two different buffer solutions until they reached the point of saturation, until suddenly the pH changed dramatically, okay, or significantly. So, when we talk about creating a titration curve, what the titration curve should reveal about the buffer is that the buffer has a buffering range and the buffer has a buffering capacity. That's what the titration curve should reveal. Now, since we're not able to do this in person, I'll show you where I've given you data as if you had performed the titrations. And I'll tell you, okay, I'll briefly go over how you're supposed to put it together, creating what we call a titration curve which should look like this, all right? Now, 
the data I'm going to give you isn't all going to be in one, uh, how do you say, in one table for each of the solutions you're performing the titration with, okay? Because when you perform the titration, you'll take one of the three solutions you made and you'll divide it up into two separate beakers and then you'll add acid to one and to the other beaker, you'll add base to that same solution. And then you have to combine your data together to get this curve. And I'll point this out again to you. But when you perform a titration curve, one thing it should reveal about the buffers you work with is that they have a buffering range. There are many different buffers and each one will stabilize the solution so that it stays within a specific pH range called the buffering range. One buffer may be effective within a range of two to six, while another may be effective between a pH range of 10 to 12. Buffers are unable to stabilize a pH outside of this buffering range. Okay, and I'll show you with the titration curve what they mean. Now, buffering capacity, okay, each buffer also has a certain buffering capacity, which is determined by the amount of additional acid or base that the buffer can handle and still maintain its pH range. So the way I want you to think about it is in the post lab, when they ask you what is the buffering range of the buffers you worked with, you're going to give the answer in pH values, but it's going to be a range. You're going to choose a pH of something to a pH of something. That's the range. That's what the range means. But you're going to have at least one or two questions. I believe it's one in, in the post lab where it's going to ask you about buffering capacity. Now, the answer for buffering capacity could be quantitative or qualitative, as we talked about in the first lab. It could be an actual numerical value, or it could be just you saying it was a whole lot or a whole little. Well, you can make it quantitative, and I want you to make it quantitative because you'll be able to do it reading the titration curve graph that you're going to create. So in this case, where it says buffering capacity, it says determined by the amount of additional acid or base that's added to the buffer, you can give your answer in milliliters. Okay, it'll be on the titration curve. It won't be hard to find, and I'll show you how you combine, how you identify both of these on a titration curve in a bit. Physiological relevance of this lab, well, again, it has to do with blood pH, okay? We talked about this before, normal blood pH, uh, 7.35 to 7.45. Outside of this range, damages cells and tissues by breaking chemical bonds, changing the shape of proteins, altering cellular functions. These little guys right here, these hydrogen ions or protons are highly reactive. You take a biochem class and you'll find out any charged, if you want to call it ions or particles, can enter, that don't belong there or that are in excess, there's too much of them, okay, they can wreak havoc and interfere, especially with chemical reactions in the body. Okay, we talked about if your blood pH falls below 7, we call it acidosis, you could fall into a coma because these little protons are interfering with your body's processes, shutting down your process, shutting down your body functions, therefore you fall into a coma. Now, what I didn't give you in lecture is this, okay, and I need to move this over, this little bulletin, it should be over here. There are actually three main buffer systems in our body, bicarbonate buffer system, phosphate buffer system, and protein buffer system. This slide here, okay, is, is uh, partly for you, but you're also going to have a question, okay, in the post lab, and it is a thinking question. And you'll want to come back and look at this slide and then look at that question, which I believe is the last one in the post lab. It is a thinking question. And uh, I do grade it. <laughs> I do put an emphasis on whether you can figure out the answer or not. Now, I've given you a total of six tables, okay, that you're going to combine into three sets of data to create three pH titration curves. Now, the title of each of these titration curves, okay, is going to be based on the name of the solution that you perform the titration on. And I'll show you these names in a second, okay? And then what you're going to do is in the post lab, okay, it's going to ask you, take your data, okay, put that data into a program, a graphing program such as Excel, and create titration curve, all right? And I'll go over this a little bit more later because notice with this titration curve, Normally, the zero value for your y-axis and the zero value for your x-axis, normally that zero value is here. But the kind of titration curve we want you to set up for this lab, the zero value for the y-axis is where it normally is. But notice, for the x-axis, the zero value is here in the middle. 
So I'll go over this briefly, how you get this zero value on the x-axis to be here in the middle. Something else I'm going to say now, and I'll try to remember to say again. When you use that graphing program such as Excel to create your titration curve, this axis here, which we're at the y-axis, which represents pH, it's going to be over here in the middle combining the zero values for the at y and the x here. You're going to have to figure out how to move it over to the left, and that's going to be your job to do on how to work with the program. Now, what I want you to make sure also, though, once you move the y-axis over here to the side to where the zero value for the y and the zero value for the x are separate, the next thing you need to make sure you do is make sure that the y-axis has the entire pH scale, zero down here, all the way to 14 here. If you don't do that, if you let the graphing program decide what the highest value on your pH scale will be on your graph, it's going to screw up your titration curve and you will be not, you will not be able, okay, to figure out what the range, buffering range and buffering capacities are because your graph will not have been made correctly. So make sure this axis is not only moved over here to the left, all the way to the left, but that it goes 0 to 14. Now notice down here on the bottom, when you create the titration curve using your data, notice to the left of the zero value is where you put your answers for, when you're, for what occurred to your pH when you added one mil of HCl at the time. Notice to the right of the zero value on the x-axis, this is where you put your pH data for what occurred each time you added one mil of NaOH going this way. All right. Now, I'll go back to this in a second. So this is everything I just went over right now. Again, emphasis on not only moving the y-axis all the way over to the left of the graph, make sure it reads 0 to 14. Okay. I already talked about buffering range, but I'm going to go over it one more time. And you have a pre-lab. It's in your lab, pre-lab. They give you a practice run asking you these questions, such as what is the buffering range. The way you deduce the buffering range is first you'll in the post-lab, okay, and they give you a practice run in the pre-lab. But look at your titration curve. And when you're asked what is the buffering range of a buffer solution, what you want to look for is where the curve is closest to being parallel to the x-axis. So you can see on this titration curve, roughly from here to here. It doesn't have to be a perfect, uh, how do you say, it? it doesn't have to be perfect straight line going across, okay? But you can see the curve here is barely changing pH value. It's barely changing. Barely changing during what? We'll look down here. Going from the zero value on the x-axis to the left, for every one mil of HCl that was added, that buffer was preventing the acid, the increase in the amount of acid you were adding. It was basically minimizing the acid's ability to change the pH. The pH roughly went from a pH of 5.5 down to roughly 5 after 5 mils of acid were basically added. If you go over here to the left, you can see here adding 1, 2, 3 mils of buffer, okay, uh, I'm sorry, of base, 1, 2, 3 mils of base NaOH to this buffer. You can see it was causing a slight change in the pH of the solution, but again, the buffer was minimizing that change. Okay, almost keeping it parallel to the x-axis before you finally add that fourth mil and all of a sudden the pH shoots up. In other words, this is representing your buffering range. Where the curve is the most flat, that is your buffering range, and your answer would be in the pH values, in pH values. Roughly, you would say for this example, the buffering range is from a pH of 5, roughly up to about a pH of 5.5, 5.6. That's the buffering range. Now, once you identify the buffering range, well, then what you do is use that buffering range to come down here so that now you can use this information off the x-axis okay, to answer buffering capacity. So that's the next slide. For buffering capacity, okay, the way we determine the buffering capacity, again, let's find the buffering range and pH value. 
once we find that, then what we do is we come down here And over here, we would look over at our mills of NaOH and HCl, and that would be our answer for our buffering capacity. Our buffering capacity would basically be uh, up to five mils of HCl and up to roughly three mils of NaOH. That's our buffering capacity. Okay, so it can be qualitative, but go ahead and just give me a quantitative measurement in mils to make it simple. All right. So again, buffering range, when you give the answer, it's a pH range. It's not one pH. It's a pH range from a pH of something to a pH of something. Buffering capacity, well, you got to know the pH range so you can come down here to the x-axis. And in mils, you give the answer for buffering capacity when it asks you. Now, this link here is also the same link that is at the beginning of your lab procedures in your lab protocol. Make sure you watch this video. Yes, it's about 26 minutes. But watch it, okay? We're not actually meeting for lab, okay? 26 minutes is only a, a small fraction of the time we would actually spend in lab. However, up here, if you look, it says in this lab, you would make three solutions. And I'll point this out in, in your pre-lab because there's your last pre-lab, the last uh, your turn section in your pre-lab is where you will calculate how much of these different stock solutions you need to create three different solutions, okay? You're gonna create three solutions. One of these solutions is an unbuffered solution. Again, it is up to you to understand what I mean, but emphasis on the unbuffered part, please, okay? Because I get a lot of students that for some reason don't catch that. The other two solutions, okay, the other two solutions, they are sucrose solutions, just like the unbuffered. However, they will also contain either an acid or a base component, okay, which will result in creating an acetate buffer solution and a bar bicarbonate buffer solution. So these two solutions, if you notice, they don't say unbuffered, they say they're buffered. These are actual buffers, these two solutions. You need to understand why I'm emphasizing this because when you look at the data I give you in lab procedures that you're gonna use to create your titration curve graphs, two of the tables contain information that you're gonna combine that are related to the unbuffered sucrose solution. And there's very little data that's added to it, but you have to, it's up to you to understand why. Okay, I've actually already explained it by emphasizing this. Okay, so what would happen is you would create these three solutions using various stock solutions you're given. Now I'm giving you an example here. All right. Two of the tables I gave you, now these are on separate pages. On one page, and I'll show you the page specifically, okay, I gave you data for the three solutions okay, that you titrated using hydrochloric acid. And then on the following page, I give you three tables with those same three different solutions, except now that data contains the data for when you titrated those solutions using the base. Notice in this example, which is directly from your lab procedures, okay, I just copy and pasted the table on the HCL titration of this acetate buffer, and then on the next page, I copy and pasted the titration of the acetate buffer using NaOH. Notice, before you add any acid, the pH value is the same, pH 4.8. Okay, the reason for that is because when you create your titration curve, okay, before you add any acid, you got to make sure that your pH, before you add any acid or any base, You've got to make sure that that pH, before you add any acid or base, you got to make sure that pH is the same. Now, in actuality, when we do lab experiments, um, what the students would do is they would create, uh, how do you say, put together the solutions at 100 mils, then they would split them into two containers, 50 mils each, and then they would measure the pH before they added any acid or bases at two separate times. And for some reason, we kept running into a problem. The pH should have been stable, and for reasons unknown, we never figured out it didn't always happen. So what we started having the students do is once they put the solution together at 100 mils, we had to measure the pH of the solution at 100 mils and then split the solution into two separate containers to titrate using HCl and NaOH. That away, when they created their titration curve, before they ever added any acid or base to the, any of the solutions, 
The pH was the same. That way you have one point, one pH at zero value. So your titration curve doesn't have a break in it. It just runs smoothly from the acid side to the base side. So notice that here. Now what is meant here, down here, is the data I gave you here, okay, is that one mil was added. We would wait a little while, and then the pH would meter would tell you, hey, pH is 4.7. You add another one mil of acid for a total of two mils of acid, and the pH stays at 4.7. You would add another one mil of acid for a total of three mils. So that's what this table is telling you. It's not telling you add one mil of acid, add two mils of acid. It's saying, hey, you're going to add one mil of acid at a time, but what's listed on the table is a total amount added. You added one mil, then you add another one mil for two mils total, another one mil for three mils total, another one mil for four mils total. Forgive me for saying this over and over, but I guarantee you there's going to be a couple of students. My English doesn't make any sense to them, okay? No offense to anybody. Same thing over here for the base. If you look, zero mils, the pH is the same for this buffer, acetate buffer. Now, however, I'm adding sodium hydroxide the base instead of HCl. But notice the same process. You're adding one mil at a time, but the table is showing you the total volume of base that you've added. I add one mil of base, then I add another one mil of base for a total of two mils. I add another one mil of base for a total of three mils. And you can see here where the pH isn't changing. But notice on both of these, the pH suddenly drops at a certain point, and I stop doing the experiment when the pH drops below a certain value. Read the lab procedures and especially watch the video because in the video, Professor Lay actually tells you when you stop the titration. And that will explain why I stopped it here. Now, the tables that we normally give the students, okay, there are going to be a lot of boxes that are blank. That just means we finish the titration based on what the lab procedures told us. The lab procedures tell you you will add this much acid to the unbuffered and buffered solutions until the pH reaches a certain point. Same thing for the NaOH. Simply put for your lab report, questions and answers from the pre-lab, you have some calculations to do, especially on the last year turn, which I'm going to show you, and you're going to ask and answer questions one through six. Question one will be the one where you're going to create three titration curves. And something I keep forgetting to tell y'all is when you create your graphs, this is for all labs, so if you haven't completed lab two or if you, ha you haven't submitted it already, if you have, don't worry about it, okay? I'm, I'm not, I didn't tell y'all, so I'll, I'll definitely not hold it against anybody. But I keep forgetting to tell everybody, you can leave your graphs in a portrait instead of landscape. If you know how to create them and turn them in the landscape while keeping the rest of the doc in portrait, that's fine. Uh, but you have the option. I think I might have forgot to change that in some of these protocols, and it's telling you, hey, create the graph on one large page landscape. And uh, I've been meaning to tell you all, no, we can simplify it a little more since this is online. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to the PDF because I can pull PDFs up on this. I just can't pull Word docs up on Collaborate. All right. So what I want to do here is pull up the PDF, and I want to jump ahead first to here. This is the part where it's going to give you a practice run right here. Okay, it's going to give you a practice run on buffering range and what have not. It's going to give you two different titration curves and ask you some information. Okay, I'm trying to get it to switch. Okay, now let me go back a page. The last page on the pre-lab, okay, it's on this page that they tell you the, the five stock solutions we would have given you had we met in person. Then it asks, tells you, you're going to first prepare an unbuffered sucrose solution. And it's going to tell you which two stocks you need out of the five we gave you to create this unbuffered solution. So you're given five stocks, okay? For the first solution, you only need two of those stocks. But keep this in mind. Please listen carefully. All three solutions you're going to make, the unbuffered sucrose solution, the acetate buffered solution and the bicarbonate buffered solution, they're all sucrose solutions. So notice all of them, all of them require that sucrose stock. So notice the sucrose stock is up here. Okay. From there, though, what you're going to do, though, is you're going to create or you're going to calculate how much of these stocks you need using the parallel dilution equation. C1V1 equals... 
C2. Sorry, I had a brain fart here. I almost wrote something else down. <laughs> C2V2. Remember, this is the formula for parallel dilution. So lap two, that parallel and serial dilutions, you're not through seeing them, everybody. So it's very important you learn how to perform these calculations. If you recall, we said whenever you're using performing a parallel or serial dilution and you have to use the formulas, you first have to use the formulas given for parallel and serial dilutions, okay, to figure out how much stock you need. Okay, what represents the stock? It's V1. Okay, so therefore, what that means is whenever, you, in this case, for the three stock, for the three, I'm sorry, for the three solutions you're going to create, the unbuffered as well as the two buffered sucrose solutions, okay, what you need to do is separately calculate how much of the sucrose solution I need, and then down here, how much of these other stock solutions do I need. So you're going to perform this calculation one or maybe as many as three times, okay, with these different solutions, all right? But you're always solving for V1. Make sure the units for the concentrations are the same. Make sure the volumes are the same also, okay? It should be milliliters, okay? V stands for volume, it's in milliliters. Keep in mind also, C1 and V1, okay, this has to do with your stock. You, up here, you can see you're given C1 for all five stock solutions. You just got to make sure you know which stock solution you're applying this parallel dilution formula to. So you have to do it multiple times, okay, for these last two solutions. C2 and V2, well, C2, you've got to know, such as, what is the final concentration I want my sucrose at for this unbuffered sucrose solution? And at what total volume do I want the whole solution, V2? Down here, you're going to use three different stock solutions for these unbuffered. I mean, I'm sorry, you're going to use three different stock solutions for these two buffered solutions, the acetate buffer and the bicarbonate buffer. Okay, so please keep in mind, once you figure out what V1 is for each of these three stock solutions, you need to add up, okay, the volume of all three stock solutions and subtract it from V2. So you know how much water to add because you want the final volume of the solutions, all three, to be 100 mils. Okay. Now, if it doesn't make sense what I'm saying, I'm going to say this over and over again. This is not a beginner class. Everybody was supposed to have had chem. Everybody was supposed to have had math. However, you can still ask me. All right. But make sure you have something to show me so we have a good start point. Okay. And give it an attempt is what I'm saying. But hopefully it'll be hopefully you'll be able to figure it out. Then what you'll do is you take this information, if we had met in person, and you would transfer it to the next page. There's just one thing missing. Okay. And I keep forgetting to move it over. This is the first page of the lab procedure. Here's the link that you'll watch, the 26 minute video of the lab. Please watch it. But going back to the previous page. Okay. On the previous page, if it ever does go back, all right. Please make sure you read the information for the two buffered solutions. Not only does it tell you, okay, which stock solutions you need and at what final concentration you want these stock solutions in your acetate buffer solution, but I believe roughly about right here, and I can't make it out for sure, somewhere in here, it tells you what the pH of the solutions, the buffer solutions should be. The acetate buffer solution, it tells you this is a buffer solution that's supposed to maintain a pH that is below 7. And it tells you what that pH is. The bicarbonate buffered solution, okay, it tells you basically that this buffer solution is supposed to maintain a basic pH. Okay, so it does give you that information in there. Now to get ahead some. We're trying to get ahead some. These two pages here, 11 and 12, is where I gave you the data. Okay. On page 11, these are your three solutions your unbuffered sucrose solution, your acetate buffer, and your bicarbonate buffer. Okay. And the data in these tables has to do with adding hydrochloric acid. In other words, you're performing a titration, but you're only adding the acid in these three. On page 12, I give you data for the same three solutions, unbuffered sucrose, acetate, 
and bicarbonate buffer solution, except now you're just titrating using the base in AOH. So what you'll need to do when you create your titration curves is you'll need to start with first the unbuffered. You'll take the unbuffered sucrose solution data for HCl and you will combine it together with the unbuffered sucrose solution titration with NaOH when you plug it into the graphing program such as Excel. You got to combine both sets of data to create the titration curve. You will do the same thing, and I did it on the PowerPoint for the acetate. For the acetate, I copy and pasted the HCl data for the acetate titration, and I copy and pasted the NaOH data for the acetate buffer titration. You'll combine all that data together to create a second graph, and then you'll do the same thing with the bicarbonate to create another graph. Okay. Now, in the lab protocol, question one, it's going to tell you, read this question carefully because it also gives you some information to help you create the titration curve, okay? Especially when it comes to making sure that the x-axis, let me switch back over to uh, the PowerPoint, especially making sure that the x-axis has that titration curve zero value in the middle, basically. Let me see if I can get this. Sorry, everybody, this program is not easy to swing around from one to the other. It'll tell you, okay, how to enter your data so that on the x-axis, the zero value is in the middle and to the right, increasing in number is HCl. And I'm sorry, to the left of the zero value is increasing mills of HCl and to the right is increasing mills of NaOH. Sorry, I said that backwards, okay? It'll tell you that, all right? Listen carefully. There is a, you're going to end up with negative values on the HCl data when there shouldn't be. Don't worry, okay, if you can't get rid of those. There, there is a code, and I couldn't even come up with it. I had to ask my lab tech, who's the one that's actually more tech savvy, uh, that was able to figure it out. But if you know how, that's great. Uh, but I'm not real picky about leaving those values. I'm mainly uh, more concerned with that. It looks something like this here. And then again, you will have to move. The y-axis won't be here when you create the curve using the information that they give you in question one to create the x-axis. What will happen is the information you're given to create the x-axis to look more like this, that's going to cause the y-axis to be here in the middle. You don't want it in the middle. Move it over to the left. Listen carefully. Your titration curve should look something like this as far as the y-axis and the x-axis. Y-axis pH 0 to 14 x-axis zero value over here towards the middle hcl mills to the right, left and aoh data to the right okay should look something uh as far as the axis goes as far as the curve goes you may have a curve that looks like this or the curve may look more look more like the other curve they give you in the pre-lap on those pre-lap questions okay i uh, hope this uh helps out uh the lab will be due uh the next, uh, this is uh, going to be Thursday lab, lab three. So it'll be due on Tuesday noon because you have the whole weekend to get it done. But also remember, you have a test coming up, okay? All right, everybody. Uh, y'all take care and um, talk to y'all later. Bye.